the Africa and world of Moshe Shea was characterized by Ubuntuism or compositionality, which is all about morality, humanness, compassion, care, and the rest. And of course, in a typical Sisutu maxim, mutu kimutu kabatu baba, a human being owes his or a social being from other humans, or oh, I am human only because you are human. This is what Francis Nyamjo calls incompleteness. And as I have already demonstrated, I ride on the shoulders of those giants without whom I would not be able to make this presentation or to be able to be where I am today. So Ubuntu is, a, so incompleteness is a cornerstone of Ubuntuism, whereupon humans depend completely on one another for their development. In Lesotho, the Litsima communal patchworks and the Mafisas, a revolving livestock loan scheme during Moshe's time worked very well. And these were used to mobilize collective energies and resources to support the well being of the Basutu. Today, what are we mobilizing to feed thousands of Basutu who go to bed on an empty stomach? If Moshe was known for his raiding skills, he used this to feed his people. Enter modernity. Modernity via the Cartesian formulation, I think therefore I am, or I think therefore I exist, and later I think therefore I conquer, undermined the African philosophy of Ubuntuism. I am because you are. The European man, the I man, sought to replace God, God as the fountain of knowledge. To be man means to reach toward being God. The European man defined himself as the center of the world, as he occupied the place of God. The European man aspires to live in a world without other. It projected itself as the only being while relegating others to the domain of perpetual becoming. Modernity sought to destroy Ubuntu's ethics of living together and moral economies of ethics and care by installing individualism. The Cartesian formulation is turned upside down the Ubuntu philosophy. I have already uh, highlighted the issues of you and me, self and other, us versus them and the like. And this, as I already say, this I consciousness versus the we consciousness is what has been magnified during the moment of COVID-19, where each country acts independently to control a virus that knows no boundaries. The Africa of Moshweshwe also had everything uh, was, was uh, uh, multiple before modernity, multiple ways of doing and knowing, multiple identities, multiple gods, multiple religions. Moshweshwe, the first people were drawn from a multiplicity of people. Everyone in Lesotho came from somewhere else and gave up a part of their identities to establish a new identity in the nation put together by Moshe Shri, told us in his 2012 Mushomi Memorial Lecture. Moshe Shri also made alliances during this period and many other African people around through trade, through marriage, through religion, and hospitality was extended to every person. Strangers were not treated as enemies. Outsiders had enough time and possibilities to become inhabitants. Diversity and plurality were celebrated. Mobility. Pre-colonial Africa had no hard rigid boundaries. If there were any, they were porous and permeable. What existed were networks, flaws and crossroads, which, may, which were more important than borders. For Africa and indeed the rest of the world, mobility, movement and the, and the like has always been the norm. The urge to move is a natural human phenomenon. The story of Basutu is firmly angered on mobility, travel, journeys, and migrations of all kinds. Moshwasha the first moved from Butabute to Tababosio, and so did Muzulikazi Rangendawa and many others during those troubled times to find refuge and comfort elsewhere. During Moshwasha's time, there were no genos and genocides. If your hunger struck, one moved away. If an enemy threatened, the leader and his people moved away. If the soil got exhausted, he moved away. Moshweshwe was opposed to the idea of criminalizing mobility that we see today. And it raises the question, to whom does the earth belong? 
Who wants to live in a world without others and why? Today, Basuto struggle to cross just a river or an imaginary line. For me, the border between Lesotho and South Africa and the rest of Africa's borders do not make sense at all. Allow me now to talk about the three alienating empires which came now and disturbed the Moshueshwe, the convivial world of Moshueshwe and the rest of his fellow Africans. Whereupon we had what I call the physical empire which colonized Africa and through the Berlin Colonial Conference, drawing borders, drawing lines and dividing people and sending people into different polities somewhere they don't belong at all. And this empire conquered obviously using violence and murdering and as Ngugi and Gacheni they demonstrate it even had to cut heads of some resisting leaders. And the whole idea was that the head that carries memory must be cut off from the body and then either stored in the British Museum or buried upside down, so as to plant European memory. African memory had to be buried for European memory to flourish. The physical empire is what was targeted by political decolonization of the 20th century. Well summed up by Kwame Nguruma's famous dictum, seek ye first the political kingdom and all else will follow. Did all else follow, ladies and gentlemen? My answer is no, a thousand times no. And the question is why? Very difficult, but very easy at the same time. The physical empire was dismantled in the 20th century successively, but it left it behind a very dangerous empire, the cognitive empire. The cognitive empire, which is teaching our kids that black is, is death, is mourning, and white is purity and virtue and, and all the like. Here is the physical empire, the most dangerous empire. The empire simply colonized other knowledges and other beings. How did it do it? There was that belief that Europeans had the, were, were born with some superiority and the rest of the other people with some inferiority. There were poets who were celebrating and glorifying empire. And I am asking if Basutu kids are made to believe that they are useless and worthless as in that primary school, it means they can only add value to themselves by imitating that which is considered superior. Fanon writes, the black man wants to be white, the white man slaves to reach the human level. To continue to teach black kids that black represents death and white represents purity is to force them to identify themselves with whiteness. Not only physical whiteness, but also the white ways of viewing themselves and the world and to remove them from the historically existing by denying them their histories, cultures, languages, and cosmologies. Question, is it possible to enslave, exploit, kill black bodies without enslaving, exploiting, and killing the knowledges, the languages, the cultures, and the spiritualities carried by those bodies? I submit to say here, ladies and gentlemen, the cognitive empire is guilty of innumerable sins. I will only highlight three sins. Epistemicides, killing other knowledges and civilizations and religions. There is no history to teach here. Go back where you are coming from. Linguicides, killing other languages. Culture sides, killing other cultures. Ngugi elaborates that the metaphysical empire was actualized through detonating a cultural bomb at the center of the universe of the colonized. He writes, the effect of the cultural bomb is to annihilate a people's belief in their names, in their languages, in their environment, in their heritage of struggle, in their unity, in their capabilities, and ultimately in themselves. It makes them see their past as one wasteland of non-achievement, and it makes them want to distance themselves from that wasteland. This is what decolonial theorists call coloniality of knowledge, which is well articulated by Ngugi again when he says, get a few natives, empty their hard disk of previous memory, and download into them a software of European memory. Is that not what is being done at that primary school in Maseru and many primary schools, secondary schools in Mokoshong, in Leribe, in Kacha, and 
all over Africa. Milan how demonstrates and explains coloniality of knowledge this way. The best way to liquidate a people is to erase its memory, destroy its books, its culture, its history. Then you have someone write new books, manufacture a new culture, invent a new history. Before long, the nation will begin to forget what it is and what it was. The world around will forget even faster. And Ali Mazuri writes, in his book, The Africans, A Triple Heritage, in terms of America and Black Americans, that they have been taught, forget where you come from, remember what you look like. Forget your ancestry, remember your skin color. Forget you are African, remember you are Black. Forget you are African, remember you are Black. This is the physical empire, ladies and gentlemen. So my uneasy, my uneasy welcome at NUL in 2000 reminded me of declarations made by some historians that Africa is not a historical continent, that there is no history to teach, there is only darkness there. And fast forward to 2017, a professor of, one professor again at this Oxford University made the same sentiments and it attempted to whitewash the sins of empire by trying to explore the ethical contributions of colonialism. If the structure of knowledge is still like this, ladies and gentlemen, it means that it was never decolonized. This empire is enabled by what I call the non-territorial commercial military commercial uh, uh, commercial military empire actualized by the World Bank, IMF, and many of these other bodies which then becomes what Jovukachin calls global financial republic. I want to pause here. Why are you boring us with these empires? What is this to do with Murena Moshuesho? You may ask. What I'm trying to dramatize, ladies and gentlemen, is the complex world of Moshuesho. The complex world Moshuesho the first found himself in and how he went about using the knowledge of the time to write himself and his nation into existence. Our world today may be in the intensive care unit, but we cannot run away from it. We need to write ourselves into existence using the knowledges we have. In the same way, Moshe wrote himself into existence using the knowledges of the time. Therefore, we cannot fully appreciate the value of Moshe as a leader unless we take into account the broader context of his world. Moshe faced several crises brought about by these empires, and Moshe, one would have expected him to return fire with fire, violence with violence, murder with murder, and the like. But Moshe chose the opposite. He chose to extinguish fire, violence, murder with decolonial love, decolonial peace, decolonial justice, decolonial coexistence, co humanness, and everything else like as the table below would show. What this says to us is that Moshe Shwe was a thinking doer and a doer thinker. He combined thinking with doing and doing with thinking. Grofu Gacheni writes about Zimbabwean liberation stalwart Joshua Ngomo as being on fire for justice in reference to his sacrifices and struggles for a liberated Zimbabwe in the same bracket with figures such as Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. How else can we better understand Morena Moshe's life of struggle for love, peace, coexistence, and pluriversal humanism predicated on knowledge, except as a person who was on fire for justice?